Well, I'm really excited to welcome OBGYN Dr. Gleaton to the interview today. Um, we are going to talk a lot about um, fertility and pregnancy, and all, it's going to be such a great conversation. So, Dr. Gleaton, I'm so excited to welcome you today. Can you just share a little bit more um, about you and your background um, and what got you? interested in being a part of the natalist company and we'll talk more about like what that is i'm really excited to learn more about what you guys are doing yes no thank you so much erica for having me we're really um, honored by the opportunity to, to share more about our company but also anything that can help our patients and our clients so i'm a board certified OBGYN practicing in charleston south carolina and I am um, with the Roper St. Francis Network, but I also am the medical director of Natalist. And Natalist is just a company that really is in tune with helping women and assisting women on their journey to conceive. And we often know that women really feel ashamed and isolated if they have any problems conceiving and often don't have a good resource to go to to get um, legitimate scientific information and many times they find themselves on mommy blogs and they have really no idea as to whether the information is pertinent or accurate and so we're thrilled to be able to combine all of that information on one wonderful website natalist.com and it has lots of scientific um, information everything that's on this site has been proven via studies and so I think that's important because you can't really find that um, on many sites these days yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing that I've loved as I'm reading more about you and everything that you guys are working on. So let's start with the topic around fertility. So can you speak to that? Like, why are we seeing such an increase over the last, I don't know how many years, right, of women having a harder time getting pregnant? Like, I hear it a lot. I've been in the prenatal world gosh, for almost 20 years, because I was doing research on pregnancy and pregnancy exercise and all that way back in college before I even ever thought about having kids. Um, and it's something that wow. I, I hear uh -huh. it coming up a lot more in conversation in the more last, I would say even five or so years, maybe we're talking about it more. I don't know. Um, or maybe it is, it is actually becoming more prevalent. No, Erica, you're exactly right. The incidence has increased dramatically, and I think because of several factors. Um, and to be honest, this is really why um, our uh, CEO, um, Hallie, started Natalist in general. You know, like she didn't expect to have a journey of infertility, and no one really does, right? But when you have it, you know, you really need some good information and resources. So in general, um, infertility is increasing and partly it's because of the health of our society. So we do know that women are a little more unhealthy often. Often the body mass index is a little higher and we often have associated comorbidities or medical complications, including diabetes and high blood pressure. And those things really affect the health of the female patient. And often that poses um, problems when trying to conceive. The other huge factor is that many of us now are pursuing higher level careers and um, um, secondary education that would cause us to prolong our um, attempts at getting pregnant. So we're delaying childbearing and that definitely affects the age of the egg, the quality of the egg, thus the pregnancy success rates. So amongst any of that, um, do you see things like such as like the toxin load on women in general products that women use? Do you see when we shift um, our women's environment that she has an easier time conceiving? Well, we definitely know. So certainly there are not a ton of studies out there in terms of application of certain products and cosmetics and things like that. But we definitely know that environmental toxins can affect egg quality as well as the overall health of um, patients. And so often patients who are in a very stressful environment, their cortisol levels are higher and they do have more difficulty conceiving. And so definitely we um, aim to reduce stress levels and also just increase the um, environment in terms of its um, uh, benefits, I should say. <laughs> <clears throat> 
Yeah, I love that you mentioned stress. Stress is something that's always coming up in conversations. It comes up in my podcast a lot. It comes right. up, and especially mm-hmm. with my pregnancy population, I am always trying to get the message across to them. Like, we need to keep our stress as low as possible, regardless of whether you're trying to conceive or you are already pregnant, right? So can you talk to some things that women can do to help increase their fertility? Like what are some of the natural things she can do? Obviously, you know, uh, decreasing stress is a good one. What are some of the things that you see specifically with a stress perspective? Because stress is kind of that root of so many things, right? It can cause gut issues. It can cause hormonal issues. It's just that whole like catapult, right? So what are some of those things that you specifically see that you recommend to your, your patients trying to increase their fertility through the natural ways first? Yeah, so I definitely think that um, stress in general is underestimated. We hear stress so often, we kind of say, oh, okay, stress, but yeah, what can I do about that? But definitely there are ways that we can do, decrease our stress and workloads. And, and I think every individual patient has to take um, an assessment of their individual lives and what's causing their particular stress. And um, no matter where the stress is coming from, our, our ultimate goal is to relieve it, relieve it or um, uh, uh, um, what am I trying to say? Obliterate pretty much. So in terms of just reducing stress in general, you definitely want to increase your exercise and making sure that you take time to take care of your health. Because of course, when you exercise, you increase your endorphin levels and your serotonin levels go up and it's going to make you happy and it's going to make you want to do other things. It gives you energy and makes you more productive. And that makes everyone a little happier. Um, in general, stress can also affect your sleep. So a lot of patients who are stressed stay up at night. They're very anxious and they have difficulty falling asleep or they do wake up in the middle of the night. And so reducing your stress can help with that. So making sure you have a good night routine where you are practicing good sleep hygiene, making sure that you're taking time to get seven to eight hours of sleep because that's when your body repairs itself. Um, making sure, of course, you reduce um, toxic relationships. That's a number one reason why lots of women are stressed um, in the workplace or at home. So reducing those toxic relationships, making sure you eat a healthy diet. There are lots of things that you can do to reduce stress. Meditation is a great one. I like to pray. There are lots of things that you can do to affect stress stress levels. So is that one of the main things when a woman comes to you and she's having a hard time getting pregnant that you address? And what are some of the other things that you're initially like, okay, we've got to get a handle, um, you know, and let's, let's turn some things around from a light, a lifestyle perspective first, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important that when you when you have a patient coming to an OBGYN to discuss um, fertility and their attempts to conceive, you want to give realistic expectations, first of all. I often have patients that come and they've been trying to conceive for two months and they heard their girl got off the pill and she got she conceived right away. So I think setting some um, guidelines in terms of what's normal and what's not normal is is primary. And then, of course, we always, in terms of the preconception visit where we discuss things related to achieving pregnancy, we always like to typically recommend that you reduce stress and exercise and healthy diet and take your prenatal vitamins and lots of those things as well. Um, But often I don't see many patients in that situation, most patients come when they really have been trying to get pregnant and often for too long. And it's kind of sad because many women don't understand the um, definition of infertility, right? So they don't know when things are abnormal. And so I think importantly, we should um, define those guidelines. Can you define those for us? Like what is infertility? And I know you mentioned like some women thinking, oh, two months, and then they might have fertility issues. But what is the realistic time, say, for a woman who goes off the pill and she's trying to get pregnant? What's a realistic time frame for her to actually expect to get pregnant? Um, can you define some of that? Absolutely. So, Erica, we look at it based on your age. And um, so in female health, there are a lot of things that age actually apply to and infertility, unfortunately, is one of those things. So if I have a healthy young um, patient that comes and she is under the age of 35, I try to reassure her that it can be 
completely normal to try to get pregnant for a full year before we suspect that anything is wrong. So in knowing that 90% of patients will conceive within the first year of trying, we have lots of reassurance to give patients that you will like out of 10 women who are trying to get pregnant. Um, after one year, we do deem that a diagnosis of infertility. And certainly if you are over 35, the time frame is reduced because we know that more women over 35 will have difficulty conceiving. And so if you've been trying for greater than six months, we diagnose infertility if you have not successfully achieved pregnancy. Okay, so then what are some of those next steps besides the, you know, shifting some of our healthy lifestyle habits that we can do that um, a woman could be aware of to know about that could help fertility. And then I have a second piece to that. What about the male in the relationship? Yes. So let's address the female first, because you're absolutely okay. right. We typically think, okay, it's, I have a problem. You know, as females, we kind of want to take things on and fix them. And so often, of course, I only see females. So I see this side of the um, coin, but patients come in and, you know, we definitely want to get an accurate menstrual history. So we want to make sure that you're having cycles at least once a month or at least every 38 days. That usually indicates that you're probably ovulating if you're doing so and making sure that you're having them in a predictable time frame because you can have cycles, but if you can't really predict when they'll occur, then it's more difficult to predict when you're ovulating. So we want to ensure that you're ovulating as well. And um, in terms of that a simple menstrual calendar or an app on your phone can help you identify your cycle regularity as well as your ovulation um, prediction. We also have ovulation tests that can help you as well with that. Do you have an app that you recommend? And I'll say like I, I have, I use two different apps for my cycles and mm -hmm. I'm not anywhere trying to, you know, get pregnant or anything like that. But I think just right, from right. a women's health perspective, I always tell every woman, you should track your cycles. It tells you so much about what's going on with your body and can also help you to predict like if you're feeling a little more fatigued Absolutely. or you might feel some cramping, you're like, oh, I'm ovulating today or, oh yeah, my period's going to start in two days from now. And it's just like, can give you some of that information to also kind of plan your schedule with a busy, busy life, right? I'm like, if you're on day one and day two of your period, don't jam pack your schedule from morning to night. Try to have those days be a little lighter, right? Like little things like that I find can right. also help with stress. But of course, in the case of, you know, trying to conceive more than ever, we should be tracking um, our cycles. Absolutely. And I don't think this is so much stuff that like, you know, I, I didn't learn half of the stuff when I was younger, right? We didn't, I, you know, I now have my 13 year old. I'm like, keep track of it on an app. And she kind of rolls mm -hmm. her eyes at me, but it's like, just from a women's health perspective, just to be more in tune with what's going on in your body. I also feel like can help take a little layer of stress off of you. Cause you're like, Oh, it kind of connects the dots and it makes it's that knowledge is power piece. And I'm a big advocate for that. <laughs> Right. Absolutely. No, I completely agree. And to be a, a fertility or a menstrual calendar um, uh, tracker, I should say, most of them have the same software in terms of making sure that they fall within the guidelines to be able to predict an accurate cycle. So I don't know that there's one um, that we would necessarily recommend at this point, but certainly they all serve the same purpose. And so it's certainly, most of them are pretty user friendly. They're very easy to use and they do a pretty good job of predicting your cycle. So if you're using one and you're finding that your cycle is always unpredictable and not predicted by those, um, those apps, you probably should see your doctor because you probably have an irregular cycle and often there's a cause. So as far as you mentioned, like with our cycles, and if we're not having regular periods, what does, what should a woman do about that? Right. And I, I know there's so much that can go into hormones, so I, we don't want to need to go down a big rabbit hole, but for women listening that are right. like, yeah, this is me. I just don't have regular periods or maybe they're too close together or whatever it is. Like, what do you recommend is like a next step for her as far as figuring that piece out? Yeah, I think evaluation, because certainly um, there usually is a cause, right? And so it could be various things, like your thyroid level can be just completely off. 
can be, like you mentioned, hormonal um, dysregulation where your testosterone levels are too high, or there certainly could be hormonal regulation where you're having premature evidence of menopause. And you would want to know that sooner than later. So it never hurts to be to get an evaluation from a doctor that you trust, that's always the first step. And often when patients come to my office and they say, oh gosh, I have a 25 day instead of a 28 day cycle, I reassure them and send them out the door because that certainly can be normal within a certain sector of the population. So whether it's just for reassurance or whether it's for a further evaluation, definitely see a doctor. Yeah, and something that I've, I've always promote a lot of is the Dutch test. I don't know if you do, um, much with the Dutch test at all, but I know mm-hmm. that that's helped me a lot just in getting hormones more balanced to see deeper with what's going on with pathways and things like that. So I always just like to put that out there. Like if that's some, you know, if you're someone who, you know, you know, your hormones are off, your cycles are not regular, like definitely searching out a, a doctor that is familiar with using the Dutch test to help because that could help show something that's going on at a deeper la- layer from a metabolic perspective as well. So I just think that's great information. I wish they had that test when I was right. younger. It's so powerful. <laughs> right, absolutely. And then just right. And then sometimes it could just be a simple shift in your weight, something really changes often things your menstrual cycle basically tells you a lot about your body like you said so I'm happy to hear someone say no the menstrual cycle I consider it a vital sign like just like your weight and your blood pressure and your pulse your menstrual cycle tells me a lot about what your hormones are likely doing and what's going on with your body absolutely I second that so wholeheartedly it's taken me a long time to like understand that you know but I I believe it wholeheartedly um okay so I want to get back to, I want you to just address a little bit the male side of infertility and what, you know, if the woman's been trying, she's been doing all these things. Um, at what point do you recommend like, let's go get him tested? I am no, by no means no, an expert in this area. I don't know a lot about it. (laughs) So anything that you can share with our listeners to be like, okay, maybe it's time to go check his sperm. And I'm sure they're checking for sperm counts and quality and all of that. Um, Erica, you're exactly right. So male factor infertility is what the term is. And basically, it's a significant portion of um, infertile couples. So one in four couples will have male factor infertility, where the male um, has a lower number of sperm or the motility, which is just the moving around of the sperm aren't right. Sometimes sperm can swim sideways and backwards and just really not go towards the target of the egg and fertilize properly. The quantity can be low and um, just the form of the sperm can be abnormal as well. So definitely it's a part of a routine workup for women um, to have their partner's sperm checked, even more so than having blocked tubes. A lot of women, in my experience, who have um, patients who have had a history of STDs, they're really concerned about their their, um, tubes, whether they're open or not. But we see that male factor infertility has actually surpassed um, block tubes as a cause of infertility. So it's a big deal. Okay. So what are some of those next steps as far as what are options for our women when it comes to, to IVF, whether it's because something's with her body, we need to boost some hormones or it is the male side of things. Like are there, I'm assuming there's things that we can do, right? Even if something's going on with the sperm. So can you speak to those options? Absolutely. So I definitely after um, recommend that after patients achieve um, or receive a diagnosis of infertility that they seek out an appropriate infertility um, office um, and practice. And I typically recommend you speak with your OBGYN, whether it makes sense to stay with your OBGYN for initial evaluation and treatment, or if automatic referral makes sense on your age. I know that the American um, Society of Reproductive Medicine recommends that if a patient is over 40 and trying to get pregnant, that you automatically get a referral to a reproductive endocrinologist. But these centers are specifically formulated to help couples who are trying to achieve pregnancy conceive more quickly. And so they do a thorough evaluation. So one, you want to make sure that the doctors within your REI practice 
are, um, of course, board certified in reproductive endocrinology. That would mean they completed a four-year OBGYN residency and then two to three additional years of fellowship only in reproductive medicine. And that's important. Um, reproductive medicine changes very um, often. And certainly you want someone that is up to date with cutting edge, edge technology to treat your um, infertility. Um, and so once you're deciding, of course, an evaluation will be done, but there are many options. Most people think about, okay, I'm going to the infertility doctor, I have to get IVF, but that's definitely not true. Of course, that's one of the more advanced um, uh, not practices, but more the advanced treatments. But certainly before that, there are oral medications that you can take that can spontaneously cause your eggs um, to release um, uh, in a more uh, effective manner. There are also um, uh, practices such as intrauterine insemination, where you're not doing IVF, where you're implanting an embryo, but you're just getting the sperm past the vagina and into the cervix so that you can more readily conceive and increase the chances and odds of conception that way. And then there are advanced technologies as well where they can actually test the embryos and only implant embryos during an IVF cycle that do not have any type of gene decreases the risk of miscarriage. And that's certainly important. Dr. Gleaton, so can you speak to women who have endometriosis and or PCOS? Because I know that comes up quite a bit um, in my audience. Women are asking about different things in relation to that. Um, you know, what do you see? What do you recommend with women that know they have endometriosis or PCOS and are trying to conceive? Yeah, you're exactly right. So a good uh, majority or percentage of patients who have infertility could have one of these um, illnesses or diseases. PCOS happens about one in six um, patients. And so that's pretty common. Endometriosis is a little less common, but about, about one in 10. So there are definitely things that we see very commonly that often affect fertility and chances to conceive. And so both of these um, these entities can be treated, but you do need the help of a specialist often. For PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome, it's a little more simple because often the problem is that they're not ovulating. So fortunately, there are ways, natural as well as medical ways and technologies that can enhance or improve your ovulation. For endometriosis, I wish it were that simple, but it's often not. It depends on the stage of endometriosis in terms of whether the tubes have been affected, whether they're ovulating, and whether they have significant scar tissue. All of these go into play in terms of treating and evaluating um, for chances of conception. So what are some of the natural ways that you would initially recommend for a patient that has, say, PCOS, if you said it's a little bit easier to address as far as helping her to increase mm -hmm. her chances of actually ovulating if she's not ovulating or not ovulating regularly. Yeah. So for PCOS patients, often PCOS is a syndrome where your testosterone levels are too low and it's associated with obesity and what we call metabolic syndrome, where you have, where you have basically um, obesity that's mainly in your midsection. And so numerous studies have shown that you can decrease your testosterone levels by losing just 10% of your body weight. And I think that's helpful for patients to hear because we, at least myself, I want a number. I like, tell me what I can do to achieve pregnancy. So I want that number. So I often give them and have your cycles return by just losing weight. And if your cycles return, then your ovulation returns and then you can conceive. So certainly that's one of the more natural things we do with diet and exercise and lifestyle changes. Um, but often women have no issues with um, their, um, their diet or their um, BMI or body mass index and they still are not ovulating. Their testosterone levels are too um, high. And so in those instances, often we provide medications that will prompt the ovary to release an egg and often it releases one or two, but that's always helpful because that's something that's very um, uh, rewarding to see a patient with PCOS get pregnant in three months when they haven't had cycles for years. So. Yeah, I know it's amazing. I know there's so much, so much out there that women can do nowadays. So it's great to 
have this conversation to help just like open up conversation. We need to talk about all this stuff more. That's part of, you know, everything in women's women. health. I think as women, we're always like, we're just going to do it ourselves. Instead, we need to like actually have more conversation around about all of this. So women know one, they're not alone. I get a lot of women that will reach out to me about things and they think that they're the only one dealing with someone. And I'm like, oh, I promise you, you're not. You are not the first person that has <laughs> shared that story, right? So it's so important, I think, for women to know like that they're not alone in this journey that they're on. Okay, so Dr. Leighton, I want to have you address, because I do get asked this one a lot, and I don't, you know, I don't have a medical answer for this. Um, so for a woman who has had a miscarriage, and she's then trying to conceive, what is your recommendation for, um, you know, ideally, how long she should wait to allow her body to recover from the miscarriage and before trying to conceive afterwards? Um, I get that question a lot too, Erica. So I think it's common on most people's minds. And I think it's because so many women have had miscarriages. It's something that people don't talk about, but everyone has experienced almost. And so um, it's definitely a common question. And traditionally, medical um, science uh, stated that you should wait at least three months. And I think the theory behind that was to allow your body's hormones to reset, to allow your body to heal, to allow you to emotionally heal, and to allow your cycles to establish some sense of regularity. Um, however, that recommendation has fallen by the wayside. And we typically now state that after you have one cycle, um, after a miscarriage, then you can certainly try to conceive if you are mentally and emotionally ready. So there's no harm. And actually studies have shown that pregnancy outcomes are no different if you wait three months versus one month just after a cycle. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm going to have to um, dig up some of that research because I get that question a lot. Um, and so that's really good to know. So one cycle and as long as you're feeling ready, you, you can start trying. That's mm -hmm. great. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's some great studies out there on that. Now, as far as this is, a, this is a little bit of a tough question, but for when women have multiple like miscarriages in a row, what is your recommendation? And I know that's kind of a big umbrella question because I also understand it's very individual as well. Um, but if a woman has had multiple miscarriages mm -hmm. in a row, what is your initial recommendation for her? Well, certainly there is something called recurrent pregnancy loss. And if you've had more than two miscarriages or pregnancy losses, then there should be an evaluation. There certainly can be various things in terms of categories as to what could cause miscarriages. So I like to think of it anatomically. So there could be something within your uterus itself, like a fibroid, which is a benign mass or tumor or a polyp that could cause you to have recurrent miscarriages. And then certainly there could be other things affecting your tube, like fluid within the tube that could wash the pregnancy out causing miscarriage. There could be various blood disorders within the the female that can increase your risk of miscarriage. Um, so there are a lot of things that can affect it. And so after two miscarriages, OBGYNs would agree that you need a, you need a workup because we can easily um, detect many of these things. So just, I have a, from clients that I've worked with um, personally that have had multiple miscarriages, um, progesterone has been a big, big like game changer for her by just really watching her progesterone levels through that first trimester and then, and then going from there. Right. I find I, that's what I've seen, not personally, but from clients that I have worked with multiple ones, that that's been mm -hmm. a key player in helping her to be able to carry that baby to term. Um, do you see that as well? You know, I can speak to that anecdotally because I do, yeah. you know, when you've had a miscarriage, you just feel like things are beyond your control and you kind of feel hopeless and helpless. And so 
I often recommend progesterone supplementation vaginally in the vagina or vaginally um, for patients who have had a prior miscarriage, but the studies are inconclusive, to be honest. Mm. So there is no strong recommendation from the American College of OBGYNs to supplement a pregnancy in a patient who's had a prior miscarriage with um, progesterone. So I often just give the patients the studies and let them make a decision as to whether they want to supplement. But it makes sense to me. Often your progesterone levels are low in the second half of your cycle. And so you definitely want to increase those levels if you can. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious about that one because I feel like that's come up multiple times um, with clients or friends of mine. And when they went on the progesterone, which of course I will say too, like it's something you need to test on a regular basis too, right? To know what your progesterone levels are as your pregnancy goes, because you may get to a point where your progesterone levels are plenty high and you don't need to keep adding progesterone, correct? Exactly. So typically you, no one would really recommend, um, using progesterone past 12 weeks or past the first trimester, to be honest, unless you're using it for a different indication. So we do use um, progesterone later in pregnancy for preterm labor and a mm -hmm. short cervix, but that's a complete different indication than for recurrent miscarriage or recurrent pregnancy loss. Okay. No, it's good to know. It's a, it's really an interesting topic of conversation for sure. So Absolutely. thank you. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate your perspective on that. Um, Okay, so now what are your recommendations that with everything that's going on right now, we're kind of in this time of like unknown, um, you know, we've got, you know, obviously there's a lot of women out there trying to conceive or maybe a lot of women have decided to like, let's wait because the times are crazy or they're like, no, I don't want to wait, like whatever it is, or they are pregnant and there's just so much like unknown, like what are your recommendations? What are you seeing right now with all of this? You're exactly right. So this is the first pandemic I've ever seen or ever <laughs> really um, thought I'd ever see and might be the last in my lifetime. And so I don't think there's a rule book in terms of knowing whether you should delay trying to conceive. And when patients ask me that in my practice individually, I usually say I would not alter my family um, planning practices based on this pandemic. The unknown is just certainly, a, we just don't know. And, and so I wouldn't base my individual decision making on COVID-19. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Okay, so do you have anything mm -hmm. else that you would like to share around any of, any of our topics of conversation today that I haven't asked you yet? <laughs> Um, no, I don't, but I, well, I guess I do. I said, no, I don't, but <laughs> I'm really thankful that you are bringing light to this topic because again, I feel regarding miscarriage and fertility, you know, like I suffered from infertility for three to four years as an OBGYN and felt that I couldn't really talk to anybody about it because I felt ashamed that I didn't know how to get pregnant. And this was my specialty. And so lots of patients feel the same way. And so if the more we talk about it as women, empower women and encourage women and get more information and knowledge, the more successful we'll be. And so certainly I'm just grateful that you're bringing this up. So if you're having issues with it, I just recommend that you definitely reach out and get help. Talk to your mother, your sister. They probably had miscarriages too and might've had problems with fertility. So definitely don't make it a hush topic, but definitely um, speak out. Yeah, I love that advice. And that's exactly what I would recommend too. I've talked to different women over the years and I always, I always feel like it helps them so much when they finally open up and share about it, right? Instead of just holding it all inside. Um, so Dr. Gluten, can you just share a little bit more about how natalists can help our women listening um, who are trying to conceive? I know you guys have ovulation kits. I know you have pregnancy tests. Um, and you just share a little bit more about everything that you guys offer. Obviously, I know you have lots of great information on your blog. Um, so that's definitely something I highly recommend women um, check that out and read a little bit more for sure. Absolutely. But we do have um, various products in terms of helping women on their journey to achieve pregnancy. And then once you become pregnant, also continuing and maintaining a healthy pregnancy. Um, we certainly have um, prenatal vitamins that have DHA, which is certainly beneficial. We have full. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we have folate as well. And folate definitely is in, um, encouraged if you are having issues with fertility, but also recurrent 
pregnancy loss or recurrent miscarriages, folate decreases that risk. We have coenzyme Q10, also abbreviated CoQ10, and that helps with people who might have egg quality that's poor and they're trying to get pregnant or they're over 35 and having difficulty. Mm -hmm. And we have vitamin D as well. Lots of, um, lots of great supplements that I would recommend. So take a look at the website for sure. So I have a question with the prenatal. Um, would you recommend that a woman go ahead and start taking that prenatal as soon as she's starting to conceive, correct? That's what I would recommend. And I'm assuming that's what you're going to recommend too. <laughs> yes. Are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I often tell my patients, if you're not taking a birth control of some sort or utilizing some method to prevent pregnancy, then you should be on a prenatal vitamin. Um, certainly up to 40% of pregnancies are unintended. And so often women have no idea that they're pregnant until they miss that cycle and you're already halfway or nearly halfway through the first trimester. So you definitely want to make sure that you um, are taking a prenatal vitamin just as a multivitamin. It's great to mm -hmm take just as a women's vitamin. So you mentioned folate. I want to just want to ask you this. Do you see women who switch from taking folic acid to folate and then all of a sudden they they get pregnant because that's what their body needed? I've heard a little bit of, of that in the like natural holistic world. I'm wondering if you've seen that as well. Yeah, I don't know that I've seen them come back pregnant because to be honest, many women get pregnant anyway. So then that first year, they just have to um, employ a little bit of patience, to be honest. Um, but I do um, typically recommend that if women are having difficulty getting pregnant, that they consider looking at their supplements and maybe mm -hmm. making small alterations such as that one and adding coenzyme Q10 and vitamin D as well. Yeah, those are great recommendations. So I love it. Well, mm -hmm. thank you, Dr. Gleaton. This was such good information. I'm so great to get to chat with you and share all this um, amazing information. Can you just share where everyone can find more information um, about you, about Natalis, if they have questions? Obviously, I'm assuming they can just reach out directly. Absolutely. So definitely natalis.com has all the information about um, various articles affecting pregnancy, pre-pregnancy, post-pregnancy, um, mental challenges. So it's really an all-encompassing website for women, fertility, and pregnancy. And then, of course, you can also reach out um, to our Facebook page as well as um, Instagram. We have lots of good information, the same information, and lots of experts who are very willing to answer questions. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I will put all the links and everything um, below the video. So it's really easy for everyone to access. And of course, you can find me um, on Instagram at Nocta Fitness or at Erica Zeal. And please don't hesitate to reach out to either one of us um, and ask us any questions that you might have.